Hello and welcome to Road to the KO, the 2016 wrap-up program of all things Koori Knockout. And we thought we'd wait for the dust to settle a little bit from Leichhardt and then bring people back in the studio to talk about the Koori Knockout. Maybe answer some of the things that happened this year and also celebrate the winning teams at this year's event. Joining us in the studio at the top of the show to talk footy is Ronald Griffiths, part of the NITV Knockout team this year. And also Shane Phillips, life member of Redfern All Blacks and the coach of the winning men's team. First of all, congratulations, Shane, on going back to back. Thanks, Brad. Um, I'm glad it's over, but it was a it was a good year. We've had a good year, and we're you know thinking back on it now. We were, I'm grateful that we've got to the other side of it. Um, we're preparing for for next year, and um, there's a lot we learnt in this year's knockout. So I think it's time to sort of um, reflect and and bring everyone together and make sure next year one's much more successful quick to jump into next year but hopefully you guys are celebrating the success going back to back is a very rare thing in rugby league it, it is it is but you know what um it, most times you probably th we've watched um sides like Minda River we've watched a lot of good sides do that and obviously saw LARPA do it we've seen um some of the other sides do it in the past but you always thought you'd savor the moment and go with it but um the pressure's on again the target's back on you um you have to make sure you you do this properly and you you segment them all and make sure you get your football part right too. So um, we have to get back to the basics again and um, we're enjoying a little bit of a breather without it now. Ronald, they were impressive this year, RAB. Yeah, it's a credit to what they've done. I mean, to to not take away from your football side of things and to have the men's and the women's side as champions, you know, it's fantastic. And, 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 and you know, running a knockout can drag away from that and you didn't let it affect you. So it's great. Obviously, the pressure is on now, like you say, the target's on your back and um, you, you've got the, the struggle of organising another knockout plus trying to, to, to win it again. Yeah, look, um, we've, um, you know, like we, we looked at a few things that we did wrong and we looked at um, everything from the way that the grounds were set out. Um, we thought if we can really isolate them and everyone can get take control of those things, we could really just get focused on on our football. And you'll talk to Danny later on, and they've got um, great plans for the women's teams now. The women they've set the benchmark for us, and we, we're trying to catch up and live live you know, um, in their shadow at the moment. But uh, you know, it, it's about just keep building. We, you know, one thing that's really I'm really proud of is we used to be the bottom of the barrel for for a while. We we lost ourselves as a community and um, we had to scrape back and own the change and that's what happened and we had to do that sooner. That was probably reflective on the park too. I remember playing years early on when I, when I was with Minda River and you know we sort of, uh, yeah, for want of a better term, put the cleaners through you a couple of times mm. but then we got you at Raymond Terrace in 2013 I think it was and um, yeah, I think we scored the first try to beat you that day and that was sort of the shift in momentum for me I thought. Um, and you've gone on to obviously win two from there so yeah, it's a probably a reflection of what you're doing right off the paddock yeah, as well. Yeah, and that, that was it. You know, you look at that year was the beginning of some success. We saw some success, and we started to feel look get that winning culture because yeah. we had this losing culture for 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 a time. You know that we, and it's hard to shake it when you got it yeah, because it you could be in front and someone score, you just seem to things fall apart. Yeah. But that was a it was a good um, mark for us of change because we used to be first ones to fight. We wouldn't train hard enough. We didn't know, every player didn't know their responsibility to their community. Yeah. It's different now. People want to make sure that they represent the community properly. We're not, no one's saints, but they're trying to do it as a, not just football, but as a, as a fathers and as brothers yeah. to do the right thing and um, be representative of your community, your family, but also work your guts out in the football field. Yeah. I think the professionalism really showed this year, and I've seen the last couple of the Redfern leading as the fittest team in the competition. I think that was the difference this year, and that every one of the 25 you had in your squad was doing their job, because that really showed. I mean, I saw other teams just not at the standard of fitness that RAB was this year. You know what? I love it. As um, I, I didn't know whether I was going to be alive to ever see it, but um, from when I was a young bloke, we were young blokes caught up in the grog, the yandy, we were destroying our lives, and we thought that was cool. Um, now I see a lot of young fellas now, they train all year round and the girls, I see them training all year round. Um, and the new hangout is the gym. Um, 
and uh, the kids are following it. The ch kids are trying to emulate it. Everyone's responsible for those children, and we're trying to bring that together. Um, that's important to us, and we'll see the, the, the ripple effects of that. And it's just simple investment of, of our, ourselves as a people, really. Um, the benefits of it are, could be in sport, but it's more so we want it to be benefits in families and, and the other stuff around our community. But footy, it's great to be able to win. <laughs> I've seen enough loss, and I uh, remember the way that the um, young blokes um, would be, you know, they were not just feel defeated, but they were, you know, they didn't know whether they were worth continuing in, in their game. But, you know, they actually got to be the, ch they, we, we said it. They had to be the solution and they chose that to be that solution. They worked hard at it. Fantastic. Well, mate, congratulations. It was a, an awesome win this year. You worked very hard. And um, the role that you played this year as the coach of the men's team, but then also being widely recognised as one of the leaders of the Redfin community, how hard was it for you to balance the hosting of, of an event and also being a coach? It was extremely hard. Not, not for any other... And, and I suppose we have to wear it as community people. We're community people. Um, we're coaching, but we're on the ground level at Leichhardt Oval, which, you know, um, we were grateful that we got a great event and a great venue and all that, but we know there were a lot of flaws in it. Um, where we'd have the people who were organised and probably were, were running flat out, but we were always visual as the team. So all of the, our own networks, we were the first place they would um, voice any concern or, or, or any of the issues, and it was really taxing trying to get your head into football and deal with a matter that had to be sorted so you can you know, make, keep communities. They travel a long way to want to be looked after. So everything from the food, we were, we were stressed out about the way the food was situated in Leichhardt ourselves. Um, and the elders weren't in Leichhardt. Um, you know, we were looking at things like parking. I, you know, uh, we didn't have control of it, but we thought um, we do have to have a say and, and build something nice that um, can complement all of that. and. We know that uh, next year we're going to be looking at everything that we, we think we didn't do right and make it better because we want to bring it, have it all connected. Um, I've seen Mindy River run it like that. Uh, I saw Lee Yowie run it like that. Walgood as well. They, they ran some great knockouts and they set the benchmark. So we want to try and get to that standard. This is a Sydney issue. I mean, I've seen it over the many years now. We've been watching and playing and coming to knockouts that in the bush and in other areas like Raymond Terrace and those areas, three or four grounds are next to each other. Mm. Dubbo as well in 2015, four major ovals with a big complex next to it. That's a dream. If Sydney had that, we would be loving it and you would be in the one place. Leichhardt, obviously the issue was distance. Distance away from each ground made communication difficult for, yeah. for all the officials from each ground to pass messages and get that around and even to travel from ground, oval to oval. Does this mean that you're fairly confident Leichhardt won't be the host next year? Look, um, I, I suppose I'm not the uh, committee, but I'm pretty sure that we've all looked at it and like how, we, although we were f really grateful for their buy-in on this, um, we need to think about the whole community and the way it works from our elders to our families, people travel. And look, the ones who get looked after last is the players. The players get out there, take lifelong injuries into the, you know, in, for the rest of their life, they've got to deal with the injuries they have made during knockout. So um, we want to make sure they're looked after. So if we can make that better, which means if we end up with a place that brings everyone together and keeps everyone on the same level, uh, elders can watch the football at the same time as in the elder space, um, all the stall holders and everyone's in one area. That's our dream, that's our dream. And we wanna make sure that um, we do that sort of thing right. Uh, it's, you know, um, we want people to walk away saying it was convenient, it was family oriented, it was culturally strong, and um, it was a good knockout. Mm. I think probably the only standout issue, which I think people would probably outside of all the logistical things was probably the decision on grand final day to remove the under 12s grand final from the main oval where a lot of people are really excited they've been playing down on Glover Street the whole tournament mm. under 12s traditionally have been a televised event for the kids to be on show and this year they weren't they were, they were bumped for one of the girls semi-finals so ho hopefully you know if, if, if the committee is looking seriously about making sure that everyone else is represented the same way historically I think that's probably something that should be resolved. In that one, I can defend them on that one because I um, I wore the brunt of that dissatisfaction. But um, it was not the, our club that had made that arrangement. It was basically based on how the, how we did it with television. So it um, was it was a it was a complicated. But you know what? We'll fix that. We'll fix it.
Sounds good. Um, what about the rest of the teams that you saw this year playing the knockout? Because you know, you, it, was a, it was a tough event. Anytime you win a, a KO, it's tough going. Who impressed you this year and some of the other teams or even some of the individuals that you saw running around for the three days in the men's comp? Uh, I loved um, what LARPA put together. I thought LARPA side, you can see all these young blokes coming through from LARPA again and ready to emerge again. I saw Cabo. Cabo were fantastic. Um, I even like sides who could, you could see the real potential in sides like Burke. Mm. Um, who worked hard and I could see they were really driven community-wise. The side, um, and I'm getting the, the Western Sydney side, the side, combined, countries. combined country side, I like that, they're all young blokes. Um, uh, I saw even um, some of the, the, I saw a Kempsey side that, that did well and they were starting to build. Uh, the Maury always do well um, and everyone says that if Maury combine their sides together, they could be anything, they could beat. That was probably the strongest performance I saw you guys all carnival was that game against Maury. Yeah, well, you know, we know Bumi's like, we've got a lot of our community who are from Maury and vice versa, you know, so um, it's bragging rights. People want to <laughs> go back and tell, rub it back into each other. So um, we, you know, everyone was expecting a good, tough game against Bumi's and we do. And, um, you know, we've got good friendships there as well. Um, Tari were good. Oh, you know what? I did love Tari, seeing Tari rebuild because Tari were an old semi side. They used to make it all the time there. That was good to see. And obviously, Newcastle. Newcastle, um, you know, um, we're in one way glad that they come out and um, gave a lot of penalties away because it helped us sort of, um, you know, um, focus on the game. Um, and we were aware that that's what was going to happen. So we just thought, well, they just played into what we were, we were thinking. And, um, you know, uh, well, they had the talent and they had the, the game to, to beat us, there's no doubt. Um, Unfortunately, in this case, um, all those penalties that they gave themselves um, didn't make that happen. Yeah, into those, those sort of conditions under fatigue, if you keep giving them back-to-back -back sets, you know, a quality side like yourselves, you know, they're always going to uh, make mistakes defensively. I mean, a lot of coaches will tell you it's not about good attacking teams that score, it's teams that make mistakes defensively yeah. and under fatigue. You can't keep doing it for long periods of time. So, yeah, I mean, it probably did play into your hands to a sense because... Uh, is that a pretty sharp sort of an outfit that played good structured footy and when the opportunity was there, you, pre, you know, that presented it, like you took it. Just one question, if you don't mind. I'm just, just wondering the, the pressures of coaching, how you deal with that or, or do you feel pressure and what's it like for you? I know for me personally, when I'm coaching, I love that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, just wondering. No, I do. I love it. Um, I had a lot of, because um, the beauty of it was, and um, I suppose I can make it public now, um, there wasn't, um, all the players were cool and Dino, we, we work as in, in a good big partnership. Um, the way that we structured is our head coach, Dino. Um, so uh, we had our plans to, to do it that way, but I didn't have the support in and around from other uh, above me, but um, the pressure was on for, for us to succeed. Yeah. And I'm thinking on my watch, I was worried that if, if they didn't do well, yeah. um, I was going to wear all that. So yeah. that was the biggest relief. At the end of it, I've got to tell you, mate, um, I was unbelievably grateful to to see the other side of it and, and walk away with a win. Yeah. I was happy to see Dean sit back down on the bench with you guys and keep coaching. No one got knocked out by NAB and he came back and, and really contributed well with you guys as that, that duo. So that was great to see. No, look, it works for us. It's really simple. And um, we've got a simple recipe that everyone's working off and they know that the benchmarks are really simple, but you've got to earn them. You've got to work hard for them. Yeah. So all, all the strategy that we had in, uh, in, in play, um, we just had to keep them focused on it and, um, you know, it's like you, it can be easy to get taken off a game, off a game mm. plan. Uh, the, the, back, the way you guys worked the back three, they were phenomenal. Like mm. the, the Robinson boys, Latrell and Travis were phenomenal all carnival. Latrell's got to be the most balanced kid not to play first grade. Yeah. He looks fantastic. Yeah, in good time, I think Latrell will. Latrell's got such great, um, he's got such humble and hardworking, um, you know, um, he's the, the genes, I suppose, but he's... He absolutely uh, epitomises um, strength and um, you know, balance, and um, he, he's committed to it. But I love how he's he's this humble young bloke who, mm. you know, he, everything's simple for him. Um, but he's got the drive to push himself into first grade, and when he does, I think he'll do really well. Just quickly uh, before we wrap up, Shane, another Latrell in Mitchell and, and the NRL players who are competing. How in, how important is it to make sure that these NRL players are contributing in this carnival? I think it is because the benchmark, you know, when we were younger, we were playing in there and there were some first graders, you were trying to get to compete against them. Um, and if you've got to play alongside them, and, um, it's, it's even better because it helps someone understand that level. Um, 
I actually, I, I, you know, at some stage, I'd like to be part of some with, with, with other people, looking at the way we balance it out into the in the in the knockout. So everyone probably gets a chance, no matter where you come from, to play with some players that play in NRL. I think it's got to be um, done properly, and we've got to at some stage own that change. Fantastic, Shane. Thanks so much for coming in. Congratulations, Thank brother, you, on back to back in the in the <laughs> KO. It doesn't come on along an awful lot. So uh, no. Shane Phillips, uh, the coach, the winning coach of the men's competition, and uh, fantastic to see. Perhaps not at Leichhardt Oval in 2017, but one thing's for sure, Shane and the RAB committee will be working hard to make sure the event can be as great as possible for all you mob who are coming in from around the state. We're going to take a break here on Road to the KO, and we'll be back with Danny Allende and Eunice Grimes to talk women's rugby league. Welcome back to Road to the KO, our wrap-up special for 2016. And joining us now on the program is the coach of the women's RAB winning team, Danny Allende Sr., and one of their star players in the proposition, Eunice Grimes. Welcome, guys, to the show. How you going? Very good. Good to have you here. Congratulations on, on another win. How many is this now for Redfern? In the, it's about five? Five in a row. Five in a row. It's pretty impressive. So, mate, Danny, you don't even need to be a good coach. You've got a five in a row. Not at all. Just turn up, <laughs> watch the girls play, and that's it. So, mate, um, I will start with you because you have been very committed uh, all throughout the year coaching the girls. Um, why do you love being involved in coaching these teams? Uh, I suppose I've always loved working with junior teams, uh, not so much the senior sides, but the women's, the minute that I got there, they wanted to listen, they wanted to learn, um, they showed a lot of respect. And so they're basically like sponges and they want to they want to get better. And so for me, it was, it was a no, it was a no-brainer. Mm, and it's a quality team you've got, Eunice. You've played in a lot of knockouts now, um, still at a very ripe young age and you'll be going around for another 10 years, I'm sure. Uh, how have you seen the knockout develop over the years? Oh, look, from when I first started, it probably wasn't so competitive. You had, you know, you had your teams, the casino girls, you had us, and really it was only two teams. Nowadays, there's heaps more, like, competition, a lot of unknown, and I think that's due to the league's pathway with introducing league at a younger age mm. and more girls wanting to be involved because there is a pathway. And you've been through to the top levels of rugby league uh, in the game and you still have those aspirations to go all the way and keep playing with the Gillaroos. I sure do. That's one of my main goals for next year, to make the Gillaroos squad. So working on that now. Mm -hmm. You play quite an intimidating game. You run hard and, and you tackle even harder. And is, that, is that part of what the playing in knockout footy is all about? It just gets all that much more willing? Yeah, well, the team expects a bit more from you because you are older. So if I am having a quiet game, there's always a lot of voices at the back saying, come on, you know, have a go. So, you know, I, I run hard, tackle hard for my teammates because I know they're going to be there when I hit the deck, do a quick play the ball, or even if I go down injured, they're going to be there to pick me up. So we all got a job for our team and I just make sure I do mine. It's, yeah, it's just impressive every year, Danny, how we're seeing the women's competition improve more and more, and probably even harder for you too. Is it easier or harder coaching your own daughter playing in these teams? Uh, I've always, I've had the experience of coaching my son in all different sports, and I, it's probably harder for her because I'm a bit harder on her, but um, no, they're pretty professional. They've been doing it for a long time. She's, you know, carved the name out for herself before I even got involved with the women's team. So I don't see her as a daughter, I just see her as another player and expect you know, her to do the job. Eunice mentioned the pathways. Uh, your daughter Jasmine did make the New South Wales women's team this year, the mainstream side, along with three other girls from RAB. That must be great seeing, continuing, as Eunice said, the pathways being available, building that competition in, in the code for the women's game and, and, and forcing them to go in through to the top level. Yeah, look, I think it was people like Eunice who, who paved the way for those young young ladies. Uh, to see, Re you know, Rebecca Riley and Nakia Davis and Lavina Phillips and of course, Jasmine, trans, you know, transfer from regular rugby league competition, then go into rep and play the way they did. Um, you know, after 17 years of losing, they finally put some crews in there and we win. So hopefully we'll have a few more uh, over the next couple of years. I heard a really nice thing before from Shane Phillips, who said that it's the women who are setting the benchmark for the men's team. That, that, that is a phenomenal comment to make. Yeah, look, uh, 
I remember one night it was probably about five degrees, it was pouring and raining, and uh, we generally start off with a warm up and train, and then we'll do some work with me, and then we'll go back and do some more work with Jeff, our trainer. And the men had already finished. They started after us and finished before us. And here's our girls doing Malcolm's. Uh, it was as cold as I've, I've had seen the girls training and they went for an extra half an hour. Mm -hmm. So they're leading away with their training on the field and on the paddock. And so the guys got back up and started training. So they are leading away, not on the field, but off the field as well, so. Eunice, you know, so the opportunities, pathways to representative level are, are there now. And the All-Stars game, of course, is there. Um, but what about now the possibility of even being contracted to play in a regular women's competition. Girls are now starting to get contracts. You, you all must be really excited about that possibility. Yeah, we are, but like the struggle we have right now is there's only one club doing it. You know, we want a lot of other clubs to put their hands up and do it as well. So how, how are the Cronulla team able to start providing contracts to the girls and the other, t and the other teams can't? I could probably answer a little bit of that. Uh, I've had contact with uh, one of the Cronulla. They've employed someone full time at the club to start to do this sort of work and um, contract players go out there, promote the game, play nines football. They've been in contact with me virtually every week, you know, what's happening with South, you know, and all these sorts of things. So um, those, you know, it looks like Cronulla are leading the way in that. And so mm. as, as Eunice said, the other clubs need to follow suit. Absolutely. Um, that's pretty frustrating. I mean, you're, you're in and around the South Sydney area a lot yourself. Um, are, you, are you speaking out? Are you being vocal about that to the club? Well, I don't really speak to a lot of the club reps, but I do let Harry, the cafe owner, know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think that you're right. That's Danny, obviously, you are doing a bit of behind the scenes pushing there at South and the other clubs as well. They've got to see where the quality of the women's game is coming from. I know Newcastle, with the girls playing up there in the Hunter team, there needs to be some more encouragement. If Cronulla can, you know, they're the premiers, they're leading the way, surely somebody else now in the NRL can see that this is the where they need to start striking. Well, we're a little local Redfern team uh, and we're coming up against a side that's got six Australian players uh, and they really didn't beat us all year and it was only in double extra uh, overtime that they got us in the semi-finals. So if we can do that at this level, um, imagine if these girls get the same training and you know access to, to all of the, the equipment and resources that they've got, these guys are going to get even better. My concern is also the country girls. Um, you know what's happening with them. We need to support. Yeah, you know, rugby league needs to support these women, not just in the in the metro areas, but in the regional and the remote areas, because there's some great talent out there. Absolutely, mate. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you too, um, uh, coach of the RAB women's team. You're also the coach of the New South Wales Quarries team, and also part of, as an assistant to the New South Wales mainstream team, which defeated Queensland for the first time this year. So well done, and a great year for you. Yeah, thanks. And look, the girls made it easy for me. Um, there's some brilliant players there. And we just basically did what we did all year. We, we, we turned up and it was phenomenal for these girls a few weeks ago to play Queensland in the Indigenous side. They're playing at 8 o'clock in the morning at Mascot Oval and went out there and really ripped in. And to do that, you know, seven weeks, some of them didn't even play like Beck Young for at least two months to come out there and the, the football they produce is, is a credit to themselves. But thanks for that, Brad. And um, as I said, I've got to owe it all to the girls. They've made it, they've made it great. Guys, thanks so much for coming in and giving us some time and our wrap up special Road to the KO. And uh, you'll be back again next year, Eunice, won't you? Playing the KO again? Sure will be. With RAB on the path to playing in uh, the Gillaroos very soon? She better be. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, look out, uh, yeah. getting in there, getting in your ear as well. Uh, Road to the KO uh, and the KO app also wants to thank Danny for his support in 2016 to help us bring our program together uh, as a sponsor of our program as well. Uh, he's a great supporter, not only for the women's game and, and junior rugby league development, but also to even to bring programs like this to you. So thanks again, brother. No worries. We'll take another break here on Road to the KO. We'll be back with a great young player moving through the ranks in the La Perouse community. Welcome back to Road to the KO and our wrap-up show for 2016. And we thought we'd bring in one of the hottest young prospects of Koori Rugby League, uh, certainly to come out of the best place in the world, and that's my La Perouse. He's uh, the under-17s captain and winner, Josh Cook. How are you, bro? Good, yourself? Mate, congratulations. Thank you. Under-17s champions. And I uh, just thought I'd slide this into the shot as well. 
There it is. He's brought it along with him. And uh, congratulations, brother. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. So you, this is your fourth knockout. You played two in the under-15s, now two in the under-17s. How are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's good. So I played up when I was in 15s, and I played my own age 15s, likewise with the 17s. So, um, yeah, it's been good. Enjoying it. I'm um, happy to get the win there in the 17s. So it was a good feeling. You've seen him come along too, Ronald, uh, and your work as a coach in the development areas. So what do you like about Josh? Uh, I think it's probably, I had the pleasure of spending some time with him with the New South Wales mainstream 16s, and um, I thought it was his, uh, he, he's, the way he carried himself away from the park, you know, his manners and things like that, and that's probably echoed, you know, in his work ethic on the park. So, yeah, and, and for, to watch him grow from, from there to, to captain that side on the, you know, the long weekend and, and hold the trophy aloft, you know, it's a great testament to you to your family and yourself, bud, really good. Hey, you come from a big family yourself, don't you? You've got five yeah, siblings. And yeah, five siblings. You've got to play a bit of a leadership role there yeah, too. Yeah, that's it. That's, I like to take that into the football um, team of things as well, uh, looking after my younger brothers, so it definitely takes a role. Nice. What do you like about playing knockout footy? You get a chance next year to go up into the men's competition and lead now on the 17s. What does the event mean to you? Uh, it means everything to me, you know, representing where you're from, you know, your community, and it's just a different brand of footy. I found that, you know, compared to your junior representative sides of South Sydney and stuff like that, um, it's just a diff different kind of brand, you know, it's a lot of, lot more tougher and, you know, different kind of vibe with things, so, you know, enjoy it heaps, it's real fun. I mean, I saw you throw a couple of flick passes at the knockout this year, you don't get away too much with that playing for South Sydney. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, you know, black fella footy, that's what it is, it's just the best. So you're now developing into playing in the South. You've been through the mats, now you're going to SG Ball, and you're also training with the under-20s team. What are your hopes now with your rugby league career? Yeah, so my aspirations are to obviously play for the Red and Green in first grade. Um, so I went through my Harrow mats, and now I'm doing my SG Ball, and lucky enough to train with the under-20s. So I'm just, you know, being patient, going through the grades, and just see where that gets me. What's your advice to Josh moving into the men's comp next year? Um, mate, just keep working the way you are. I think that, you know, you've got a great ethic. I've seen what you do and, you know, I think that, you know, you're a really good middle third player and I think that's, you know, long term, that's where you'll be. Um, you know, I watch you do a lot of work um, on your own personal game and that's the most important thing is keep working at that. Is there one thing that you really find challenging, you know, between 18s and 20s at South? Yeah, it's, it's you know, trying to get comfortable with, you know, surroundings and um, different plays you also got to know. So yeah. just developing into that different kind of game game plan and whatnot, so yeah. Yeah, the biggest thing I suppose is make sure you, you know, you highlight that with the coach, you know, obviously you're going between two yeah, different definitely. grades, they've got different you know, different philosophies, different standards and, and patterns of play, so you know, you should be really vocal with the coach about that yeah. sort of stuff. Have you, you've, you've moved around a little bit as you progressed up through the age groups from playing in the backs, now playing at a hooker role, where do you see yourself in the future? Um, I like how I'm uh, playing in hooker now, I'm enjoying it, you know, I like being amongst the defensive kind of things, uh, running the ball, I feel as though that's my place, uh, being around the ball more and, and just getting more into it. What a progression of hookers that La Perouse has produced in recent years, I'm looking at you know, the, the Garvey boys, Craig and Grant, both have played NRL football now. Uh, Grant debuted this year with the Roosters, and Nathan Peets is a, a former LARPA junior who plays hooker. So you, you potentially could go into the men's competition next year and be fourth string hooker if Peetsy decides to play KO. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely got to mix it, mix up your play then. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But you won't care where you play. No, you? I'll play anywhere. You know, as long as I'm representing my community, especially for LARPA boys, so I'll play anywhere. The one thing for sure, LARPA produced a seconds team this year again, playing locally, which really was. Nice to see a lot of veterans playing with a lot of the younger players. So even if it means young ones like yourself have to come up through a seconds team first to play, um, then that's fantastic. I mean, we didn't have pathway football when I, when I was a kid coming up through the ranks. So I remember playing in that LARPA 2 side against grown men from the bush. Yeah, I'm a fair skinned black fella from LARPA. I was scared to death. Mm. Um, you probably don't need to worry about that now because of your four years of travelling in through the knockout, you're going to men's next year, you're comfortable around playing in KOs, is that yeah, right? Definitely, I mean, going from the 15s, 17s, and and now going to the men's, it's like a pathway to myself. Mm. So I feel as though that, you know, I'm ready, I've, you know, experienced it. Men's is a different thing, yes, but I'm glad I've played 15, so four years under my belt already. One of the things that you, we talked about before, and, and through social media being heavily involved more around the knockout these days is, some of the experience that you saw around uh, some racist issues, even on the field around the game, something that we really need to touch on and, and try and resolve for next year's event. Definitely. Yeah, it's one of those things really, you know, um, myself, like a light-skinned uh, blackfellow, 
Um, I find that, you know, I, I don't be seen as an Aboriginal boy, so I do got that, but, you know, this is one of those things. So it's just in the footy, you know, they don't mean it, but in the game, you know, anything mm. goes. So. Cuts pretty deep, but doesn't it? Yeah, brother, you know, it doesn't matter whether they mean it or not. You know, that's, that shouldn't be tolerated at the end of the day. Um, you know, we're all, all one, you know, that, that's, and you represent yourself, you know, your family, you know, really proudly. You do a great job of it. Yeah. Josh, you skipped the 17s this year and you won the trophy. Let's just see that trophy. Well, oh, here we go well, again, go. eh? <laughs> go, LA. <laughs> but, uh, you know, hopefully a progression of that through and you've shown some fine leadership, mate, for the 17s, and we know that you'll do that through South and the SG ball and also in the... The under 20, so good luck with your career. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. No worries, bro. Thanks. Uh, and girls, he is available uh, if you wanted to. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Don't, 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 don't put you on show too much. Um, but just wanted to showcase some of the great young talent coming through. Uh, congratulations to the Kiranari Hostel mob and Ash Gordon and his mob for winning the under 15s competition. They were a fantastic outfit, weren't they? And also to the Tari mob, South Tari Biripai Sharks, put in. Great performance in a lot of grades this year. We saw some fine talent coming through in all of the grades. Congratulations to them for winning the under-12s competition. Take another break here on Road to the KO in our wrap-up show for 2016. And Ronald and I will be back to wrap up the event for 2016. I want somebody to run India out of space. Just sitting there but not going to laugh for us. Hello and welcome back to our Road to the KO 2016 wrap up special and uh, Ronald Griffiths uh, it's been another big year for the Koori Knockout 46 years of such a fine event next year it'll be 47 and ROB have got another big job to to host the competition what are your comments and thoughts for all the mobs out there getting ready for next year's KO? It was a fantastic spectacle. I think that um, this lay period in between October and December, or January next year is probably the, the period of time where you can you know, get a lot of your leg work done around sponsorship, uh, preparation, team preparation, and, and who you got, different things like that. So I think it's, a, it's time now to go out and make hay while the sun shines. You know, that was my personal belief. So um, you know, preparation's the key, and they need to be into it already, I believe, if they want to challenge next year. And especially around plays as well. What I've seen... When communities are performing at their peak at knockout time, it means that they they didn't just get together two or three weeks out from the event to bring their best team together. They planned ahead, they, whether it be social events, getting up, catching up, being together, or, yeah. or trying to play together as much throughout the year, which isn't always possible when players go to either high levels yeah. or live out of community. No, something big that we introduced was um, like a Christmas party, you know, with Minda River at different stages and also a presentation that, you know, that was a chance to bring people back together. Yeah. Um, and, and we were thinking two and three years ahead when we, were, when, we were, when we were talking with players. So it wasn't about the next 12 months, it might have been about, you know, in two years' time. And that's how we, you know, our thought pattern around things. And Ronald, thanks so much for all your effort this year with Road to the KO. Great to have you part of the show. Uh, we couldn't have done this program without the great support of our sponsors, the likes of the Yalang Aboriginal Education and Training Unit for your big support of us this year. Thank you. Why are we gambling help? Ash Gordon and all the crew there, thanks so much for supporting our little initiative this year. Thanks also to Fighter and Jason Wells for making us all look skinny and deadly in these shirts. You've got a bit more work to do to make us look skinny. Uh, but thanks also to the team behind this program. Congratulations to my brother Mitchell Ross and his work he did with the KO app this year. Thanks to all the mob for downloading that. We hope to make that bigger and better in 2017 at the KO. Congratulations to my brother Juro Sen for this great studio that we're in right now and producing the show and putting a lot of hard effort uh, and working behind the scenes to make this program possible. Thanks to the greatest Devon sandwich maker on the planet in one of our producers in Barry Lenahan. Thanks to Cornell Ozies for our opening introduction as well and, and the great editing work that he does. Uh, but from all of us here, thanks so much for being part of our show. To all the people who've sat in this studio and been part of our stories throughout the year, thank you very much. We hope to be back bigger and better in 2017 on Road to the KO.